Well, Joy, thank you so much for being here with me on the Entrepreneurial Success Podcast. I'm truly excited to have you here. We're going to talk about a topic which I think a lot of people get a bit confused about because there's so many people talking about being multi-passionate and so many people saying only do one thing. So I think it's really important that I bring you on the podcast and we talk about multi-passionate creatives in particular and to say that it is okay. There's nothing wrong with that really. But before we get started, why don't I hand over to you so you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited about where we get to go in our conversation together. Cannot wait. My name is Diana Joy, and I go by my middle name because my first name has an apostrophe. Most people don't pronounce it correctly, and the internet just cannot get with the program. I cannot enter into any forms or have it in a website URL or anything. So we'll go with Joy. So you can call me Joy, and all of your amazing listeners, you can call me Joy as well because we're all friends now. I am a multi-passionate creativity educator, content creator, community builder, musician, writer, and honestly, the list goes on and on. I'm super multi-passionate and all of the work that I'm doing now is to really empower multi-passionate creatives like myself to embrace your talent as a gift, not a burden. But when I say that, it's like a very beautiful, pretty combination of words, right? And without actual tools that you can use and practices that you can implement, it can really fall short and it can feel like a great empowerment affirmation without the practical tools. So my work is to bring the tools that can bridge that gap. So I teach a holistic approach to focus. I teach a little bit of project management, the creative way, and I'm really helping my community see where they can embrace structure and embrace focus without sacrificing their creativity. And that really allows you to blossom into all of what you want to be as a multi-passionate. I know. And I love it because you know what? I think so many people are listening to it in particular when you said you're a musician, you do this, you do this. And they're like, oh my gosh, is there end to the list? But I think this is what we come across these days is there are so many people who are always being told, just focus on one thing, just do one thing, which is okay. But also there's a point where we've got to realize that we have other interests and interests as well. And that's where we talk about the multi-passionate creatives. Tell us a little bit about your story. How did you get started? How did you get started with your business? Sure. So I started my business kind of on accident, first of all, and also from a place of really wanting to express myself. So what I'm doing today all started with a blog. I started a blog because I was so frustrated that every, all the inputs, all the advice was saying, you must niche down and then you can start your business or you need to niche down and then you can start your blog. And this whole concept of choosing one thing was just really, really foreign for me because that wasn't coming naturally to me as a multi-passionate. And for the multi-passionate creative, this concept of choosing one thing is so foreign that it's actually asking us to abandon ourselves in order to assimilate to what is appropriate in our society. What's the society norm, societal norm? And I really just couldn't do it. I would go, okay, I'm gonna be a singer and I'll go all in on that. And then I would like go, and I did it, right? I would go, I was singing in bands and doing that. But then there was a part of me that was like, oh, I really wanna create digital courses and I wanna educate and I wanna teach. And it felt like there was always these opposing desires overlapping constantly. So when I decided to start my blog, it was because I did not want to choose. And so instead of choosing one thing, I decided I could choose one platform. And that would be my workaround. So I started my blog and called it Joy Knows How, which is still my brand today. I called it that because I wanted it to be super open-ended. And so I was blogging about plant care, home decor, affirmations, a little bit of self-help kind of self-development stuff peppered throughout. And I was just experimenting and allowing myself to express. Then one day I wrote a blog post called It's Time to Start Celebrating Multi-Passionates. And when I started to write that blog post, something happened. I could feel that I was 
really, I, I just had never felt so passionate about any piece of writing before. And it was also the same with how it went out into the world and how it landed. I got a lot of great feedback from it. And so I realized, okay, this is what we get to talk about. It's not talked about enough. And so I began to just continue down that route. I started talking more about creativity and the creative process and more specifically what it's like to embrace yourself, embrace your talents as a gift, not a burden, as a multi-passionate. Eventually, not, not soon after that, blogging didn't feel like enough. I wanted to help more. So then I started coaching. From there, I started doing courses and group programs. And now I am more working hand in hand with my community to provide them tools that they need. And so that's kind of my story, totally on accident. I think I'm still like putting my business hat on and going, okay, this is a business. This is not just a blog anymore. And, um, you know, making that transition. But it's truly coming from a place of, wanting to provide the support that I wish I had had earlier in my experience. Yeah, and, and I love your story in so many ways because it does show that it came it, it came and developed basically from something that you really enjoyed, that you're passionate mm -hmm. about. Um, but also, you know, it kind of took a turn because you're a multi-passionate person. You've got so many different interests and you kind of use that in order to say, hey, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. there are ways to manage it. And I think this is very much where we can fairly quickly start talking about the first thing in the topic, which is about that confidence. Mm -hmm. As a person who's got so many interests, it is very hard for, and I'll say us because I'm one of them, it's very hard mm -hmm. for us to kind of build our confidence in all of these separate areas. So what would you say, what are the tips that you can share with somebody about cultivating that confidence? The number one, the number one thing that I will say is a quote that I'm going to borrow from a mentor of mine that I had previously. And he would say, confidence is a result of action. Often when we wait for confidence to arrive before we take action, we're setting ourselves up to be in a place where that action may never come because we're relying on something that we have not cultivated within ourselves yet in order to be the catalyst for taking that action. But when you do the thing a little bit terrified, but you just do it anyway, and then you realize that the world's still spinning, you're okay, everything's fine, that is how we start to build our confidence. So that's the number one thing is, if there is a dream project, if there's something that you've been wanting to create, but you are feeling like you don't have the expertise, this is a big one for multi-passionates, you know, because we're not really experts in any particular field per se, we like to dabble, right? So if that's what's stopping you, consider just turning that around and flipping it on its head, take action first, and then do an inventory of your level of confidence after. That would be the number one thing. The second thing is to really consider looking at your passions and your skills as representations of the deeper values that you hold. So for example, I love to sing and I love to write songs and play the ukulele. If I was to say this is just an interest or a passion that I have, I could look at that as a distraction and I could feel a lot less confident showing up and expressing that and sharing that particular mm, gift. But true. I see that as I love to connect on a human to human level with these core emotions that really bond us all. And I don't know a more powerful way to do that than through music. It's a way to express. Also, it's tactile and I don't have to look at a screen. Like these are things that I really, really value in my life. So really tapping into the deeper meaning and the values underneath all your passions can help you to feel more confident because then you're not saying, oh, I'm just all over the place and I got this over here and this over here. No, you have a lot of values and you were born into an experience where you're expressing those values through your creativity. That's nothing to hide or be shameful about. And you can really show up with a lot of confidence when you have that context. So mm -hmm. it's these small shifts in perspective that can really, really, really help. And then also I have to just say like, find a mentor who gets you. So follow me on Instagram, get on my email list, like hang out with me. Find someone who is maybe just a couple steps ahead of you, who's not being dismissive about the fact that you're multi-passionate. Because in my personal experience, a lot of my lack of confidence early on came from having a more traditional business coach 
and that, and them really feeling like I just didn't have it together. And I was all over the place and eventually being told they couldn't help me because I refused to choose one thing. And so you can imagine that did quite a number on my confidence. So when you can find a community or a mentor, or even just someone whose content that you enjoy, who is continuing to empower you, that's really, really important. We got to be mindful of what we're, what we're taking in. Right. So I think those are three great places to start. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love how you laid it out. And I think in particular, I want to talk a little bit about the action part in order to build that confidence. Mm -hmm. It's so, so true because I always say that, um, you know, for every actionable step you take, you get a reward and that reward is mm -hmm. confidence. So mm -hmm. it's exactly just the way you said it. You feel like, oh my gosh, lightning hasn't struck. The walls haven't caved in. I made it. Yep. <laughs> and that makes you feel good, which is your confidence growing. And then you take another yep. little step. Again, you get more confidence, more confidence. And that's how you grow. So yep. confidence isn't something that just drops out of thin air on you. You've got to go out there and get it. You've got to go and get that's that right. reward. So I love how you put that together. And the other thing about, you know, the, the mindset behind thinking that, hey, if I go out there and sing, I really enjoy it. It's not because I'm wasting my time when I'm supposed to be doing something else. That is so true. It is all to do with the energy. And when you said it, I was like, yes, of course. And you know what? Mm -hmm. I find this very much as well. This applies for business owners when we decide, hey, I'm going to take half a day off. And then we feel that actually, you know what? I could have been doing something with that half day, with that time. I could have been doing something, you know, different. It's like, no, no, no. It's your energy. It's your mindset behind it. If you choose to do mm -hmm. something, go and enjoy it. Because again, mm -hmm. it's that whole kind of concept behind it. So I love how you put it together. Now talk about focus. I think this is the other thing that multi-passionate entrepreneurs and business owners in particular um, this is something that we all struggle with, but you've got an amazing framework in order to help us keep focus. So what would yeah. you say that is? Yes. So first of all, I think the number one thing, and I realized this recently, I'm like, oh, maybe I should say this out loud more often. When I talk about focus, I'm not only talking about concentration. And I think that that's a really, really important distinction because when we equate focus with concentration, then we say, oh, I don't have focus because maybe we're just not able to concentrate in a particular way. They're very, very different. So I kind of think that focus is this nebulous, very vague concept actually. And a lot of us don't even really know what it is. And so me being the disruptor that I am, I began to say, you know what, I'm going to totally disregard everything I think I know about focus. And I'm going to start observing my process instead and trusting myself. So this is how the framework was developed. That's just a little backstory. And what I realized is when I'm not able to complete a task, or if I'm a lot of multi-passionates who are listening to this are about to be in agreement. We tend to start things and not complete them. We start something, we are excited in the beginning, we get going, we haven't maybe zoomed out and looked at how it fits into our big picture plan because we're just, we dove right in, we're pumped up, we're working on it, we're working on it. Then midway, we start to have all these doubts. Wait a minute, should I have done this instead? Should I have done this first? What about that other project that I didn't finish? Should I go and update that? Now we start to lose momentum because we're exhausted. We're, mm -hmm. That's really, really exhausting. Trying to complete a project when you're doubting and you have all these other voices in your mind, right? So I started to realize, oh, interesting. I'm not able to complete a task or to focus or to concentrate if I don't have clarity first. Yeah. So then I started to think, okay, well, what if focus also gets to look like zooming out and taking an overview of the bigger picture, looking at everything on my plate, making sure there's nothing that's conflicting, having any conversations that I need to have with myself and or others in order to remove things from my plate, if necessary, giving myself that permission, another major key for multi-passionates, give yourself permission to change your mind as often as you need to, you won't always take it, but you need that permission. So I now call this intensive focus. And it's the first part of my three-part focus framework. So intensive focus is 
taking some time. I actually did this just before our interview. I was looking at my vision book, re rooting back into my why, basically vision board, but I do multiple pages because I like to keep adding to it. So really just thinking into my why, why am I doing all of this? And then I wrote down my list of priorities and my list of commitments. I made sure that they match up and that there's nothing conflicting. I saw a few conflicts, but they're time sensitive and they're going to wrap up soon. And I'm okay with that. But I let myself go there. I let myself have this big picture zoomed out focus. And to me, that is so productive. Just because I'm not crossing off tasks off my list, I'm creating clarity. I'm rooting back into why I'm doing all of this. I'm making sure that I'm in alignment with everything that's on my plate. I'm giving myself permission to put things down or move things around as needed. And from that place, I can go into the next type of focus, which is active focus. Now, active focus is more akin to concentration. Active focus is messy bun, get it done, let's go. That's how we gain momentum. It has a lot to do with what we we're just talking about with taking action, right? Those action taking tasks when you are building that confidence, that's coming from active focus. That's writing the emails, talking to the clients, doing the actual work. But intensive focus comes first and then active focus. The third part of my framework is passive focus. And it also touches on something else that you said. Take some breaks. This concept of just working through the whole afternoon without taking a break, you're going to be so tired. And this is how we start to develop a really tumultuous relationship with focus because we start to think that when I'm focused, I end up exhausted. So infusing passive focus throughout your day, taking those breaks, that's really going to help you keep your momentum going. And you can utilize passive focus really strategically by filling that space in with something else that is related to your project. So that could be attending a webinar, listening to a podcast, daydreaming, right? Or you could do nothing at all, but there's, there's options there. So that's my three-part focus framework, intensive focus first, active focus, and then passive focus in between. And I do teach all about this in my ebook. So that's a great place to start. But even just listening to that, you can sort of get a feel for the way that I approach focus is it's not just you either have it or you don't. It's mm. creating your own relationship with focus from an energetic level. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's a brilliant framework. And I think, you know, this, this, I also want to talk to you about the myth. And I think this kind of leads beautifully onto this myth about that, you know, as a multi-passionate, you only need to choose one thing. And, and I mentioned this even when we started and I was like, yeah, God, it's such a myth. So tell us a little bit about this myth and, and why it's not true, you know, in, in, especially in order to be successful. Yeah. I was just talking to my clients about this and I was telling them I have a group coaching, um, a group coaching program and we just wrapped up the final cohort. And I said, if you remember nothing else, I want you to hear my voice in your head, plant this in your mind. Do not let anyone bully you into choosing one thing before you arrive there organically. So here's what I believe. I believe that there may come a time in any person's entrepreneurial journey where you land on this is the main thing that I love to do and I'm going to put most of my eggs in this basket and I'm going to have a few other things you know around that that to me is such an organic process we arrive there by default from trying things out but it's this concept of that we need to know that first before we try all the things that I just cannot accept. It just does not, it doesn't even make logical sense. Mm -hmm. So here's how I like to think about it. You know, when you go into a frozen yogurt shop, the first thing that you do is you get a little taster cup. You take that little taster cup and you try different flavors. You try things out. You see what you like. You might try some combinations, right? And then you know from an intuitive knowing what you want to kind of go all in on and you go grab your big cup. And even then, if you're anything like me, I've got like toppings on the bottom and then a couple different flavors, toppings on the top. There's still this combination, even in that big cup, and that gets to be okay. Now, no one's judging you in the Froyo shop saying, how dare you walk in here and not just get your big cup and get one flavor? You should know that before you try things, right? There's so many other places in our lives where that is completely normal and completely acceptable. But when it comes to business, somehow, if you don't know exactly that one thing that you want to do out the gate, you're just all over the place and being multi-passionate is not a good excuse and all this and that. So 
I'm not going to say that it's not, it is good advice to have, you know, your main core thing that you're known for and all of that. I'm not going to bash that because there's so much truth to that. It is absolutely a useful place to arrive to in business. However, forcing yourself to get to that place without organically discovering your likes, your dislikes, what your community actually needs, all of that, that is the most beautiful part of the exploration and the becoming of who you are as a multi-passionate and what you're going to express. Then what happens is from each of the things you try, you learn something new about yourself. You learn, I love doing live calls or I only want to do pre-recorded content or I love doing one-on-one. -on -one. I just love that connection. Or you know what? Group coaching only. I'm not doing any one-on-one. -on -one. You learn all these little things. You learn, I love creating graphics. I love making all the workbooks. I like to deliver materials. Or I can't do any of that stuff. That's not going to be a part of my, whatever it is. And you take pieces from every single thing that you try. Here's the beautiful thing about the way that the multi-passionate mind works. When we put something down, we still take everything we've learned with us. And because we are great at making connections, we can then create all those connections that can eventually snowball into, yes, maybe having a flagship program or a flagship offer, but it's going to bring a lot of ourselves into the fold, a lot of ourselves to the table. And at that point, that's the only point where we're going to feel truly confident about going all in on anything. It's if we are not sacrificing so much of ourselves, but instead we're bringing even more of ourselves forward to the table. So that's kind of my long-winded answer, but I just think the concept of coming out the gate, choosing one thing and then sticking with that to be successful is archaic. I think it's completely archaic. A lot of people who coach that way and who teach that, if you look at their businesses, they are literally doing more than one thing. So it's even, it's upsetting for me at times when I see people giving that advice and I call it blanket statement advice, right? It's really easy to say, choose one thing because then you don't have to try to get to know that multi-passionate client that you're working with. Yeah. Right. If you can just say, well, you know, the path, the easiest path to success is let's go all in on this. Then you don't have to be curious about the person that you're coaching. You don't have to find out what it is that they're hesitant about, what they haven't had a chance to explore yet. And so I think it's kind of a cop out and it's, it's pretty harmful. So I think that we need to just make sure that if you have a multi-passionate person in your community as a client, that you are curious about them, their passions, their values that are attached to that, those passions, and you're allowing them and encouraging them to try things out because it is eventual and 100% going to happen. Eventually, you're going to know what you want to go more yeah. so all in on. It's just, it's inevitable. It's hard to imagine a world where that doesn't happen. And if it doesn't happen at all, that's also an intentional choice. That's an intentional choice. I'm going to choose to have these three projects and I'm going to split my time and I'm going to hire a team around that. That gets to be an intentional choice as well. So, I mean, I could keep going. This is like, I'm no, so passionate about great. that. <laughs> I love it. You know what? I think the analogy of the yoga shop is so, so, so good um, because when you were starting to talk about it, it's like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I say to my clients because especially in the first year or two of business, especially when you're starting yeah. out, you know, and I was there myself, you try and do everything. You try and figure out what is it that you need to do. And I think so many people get frustrated with themselves going, but look at these other people, they're making a success. And you know, and I'm still here dabbling around and not finding what it is that I need to do. And then I say, it is okay. You do need to go through that process. And, and trust me, even if you've gone through that process, you're gonna get it again at some point. It is always a recurring process and it is okay. It's okay to try out things. It's okay to try frozen yoga, different flavors, and then come back and get to a point where you go, right, now I need to figure out what is it that is really aligned with me? What is it that I need to have focus on and your particular focus that you spoke about? And then just go with that. But then be okay with the fact that either it's one thing or it is a couple of things. You divide your time up between that. Mm -hmm. Because that's how we experiment. That's how we get to learn. That's how we get to develop ourselves, our expertise, 
And, and I love how you put it all together because that's exactly, it, it kind of encompasses just perfectly what I always share as well. So I'm glad we're of the same mind. and I'm glad we're speaking the same language because at the end of the day, people, it is okay to be multi-passionate. It is okay yes. to dabble with things because it only means that you are learning, you're experimenting, and it's okay to let it all happen organically. Just like Joy said, there will come a point where you go, okay, what is the right thing for me? And you'll feel it. Nobody can tell you when it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. It is going to happen organically, but it is okay. So be patient with yourself. Very, very important. <laughs> yes. Enjoy oh, the process. Little exactly. cup phase, I call it. Enjoy little cup phase. You'll, you'll learn so much. A little so cup phase. I love that. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna call the little cup phase now. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Joy, this has been absolutely amazing. I just love your passion as well. How you're talking about this, and I think it is so important to to bring this to the audience, because yeah, there's there's a lot of people out there who are multi passionate creatives and feel like they almost have to be ashamed for the fact that mm -hmm. they like doing more than one thing. And it's, it's not that actually, I think for people who are multi-passionate creatives, they're, they're very quick learners. And also they, mm -hmm. they have, how can I say, they are never boring people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's yes. always something going on, which is okay. But before we go, yes. before we conclude all of this, oh my gosh, you have got an amazing freebie for everybody, a free quiz. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the quiz first, and then we'll dive into some of the other things. Sure. So I created a quiz. It's the creative focus style quiz. And I created this quiz because I think with focus, like a lot of things, we tend to really get caught up on thinking about what we lack. So instead, I wanted to create a quiz that's going to be empowering for you, and you can see what you already have access to. So this quiz is going to help you see what's your creative focus style. Is it dreamy? Is it electric? Or is it expansive? Those are the three names that I gave them. So you can take the quiz. We'll drop the links in the show notes, and then you'll see your results. You'll see what type of focus comes the most naturally to you, how you can lean into that, and just a little tidbit behind the scenes, each of the focus styles connects with one of the focus types in my framework. So whichever one comes naturally to you, that's great. But if you want to really magnify and amplify your relationship with focus, grab my ebook and you can plug in the other types and you'll be good to go. Amazing. Yes. And like Joyce said, the details will be in the show notes. So obviously go and get that um, quiz there. I think yes. it's very interesting. I'm going to try it out myself as well. I want to kind of yes. see what kind of creative I am. But then yes. you did mention the ebook a few times. So tell us a little bit yeah. about the ebook as well. Sure. My ebook is called Finally Focus, and it teaches my three-part focus framework that I was speaking on earlier, but it's a very structured, easy to follow, easy read. I also give some personal stories and examples of how I use the framework to write my ebook, to create the time in my schedule to get it written. And there are some interactive pages as well, where you can really start to practice the framework. When you purchase the ebook, you get access to a digital product portal that also has a bunch of bonus content in it. So it's really not your average ebook. It's more of an experience, but that's because I know how multi-passionates are. Just an ebook is okay, but something where you can click around and you can watch the launch party that we had for it. There's a bonus training on how to do a focus audit. There's a bonus chapter. So there's like a lot of goodies waiting for you as well, even with just purchasing that ebook. And more than anything, the thing that's the most powerful about that particular thing, that ebook, is that it's your first step in starting to look at focus in an entirely new way mm -hmm. and starting to open your mind to what life can look like when you're living it through the multi-passionate approach versus trying to fit into a box and doing things the way that everyone else does them. Yeah, amazing. And thank you so much. You know, so obviously the free quiz is there available, but the ebook yes. um, is available e as well. It's $37. Purchase. $37 yeah, 37. US dollars. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah. that link will be there as well. And then if you would like to get in contact with Joy, by all means, um, her Instagram details, her website details are also down below in the show notes. So stalk her, yes. check her out, get in contact, DM her, whatever you want to do. But then the great news is as soon as this podcast episode is launching, you will also get access to Joy via her podcast. So she's also going to launch a podcast very soon. So by the time you guys get to see and hear this episode and watch this video, 
she will be already up and running. So she would love to share that with you as well. So I'll make sure that the podcast um, details are also in the show notes. Wow, yeah. gosh, that was a mouthful. But you know what? <laughs> That's what we get when we're multi-passionate people. So Joy, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure getting to meet you, having a great conversation. I'm sure the audience made some great notes and also had a few aha moments and went like, oh, it is okay. Let's relax about yes. this. But thank you totally. so, so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>